Ah. Good grief. And this is just to get to the back gate. Welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. Today we're looking at how the earliest church got the celebration of the Lord's Supper all wrong. I also promised you an update about the windstorm and how it took a tree and attacked our back house. But before we get to that, we have to jump into our content. Stick around to the end of the video and I'll give you an update about the status of our house. But right now we need to get inside and look at 1 Corinthians 11. Mm. That's good. Glad to have you all here today. Today we're asking the question about why are shared meals so important to us as human beings? What is there about eating with someone else? Not only are we physically present with them, but sharing a meal together creates a bond over one of our most primal activities, taking in food so that we can live. Food not only satisfies our hunger, it gives us energy and it nourishes us so that we can live, but it's also highly rewarding. Good food tastes great. And in the process of eating, our bodies release hormones that make us feel better as well. So sharing a meal with someone else involves sharing these very bodily reactions with them. It creates a very deep, primal, and emotional connection, something that is recognized across all cultures. We have four accounts of the Lord's Supper in the New Testament, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians. In this video, we're going to look at Paul's version of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, there's some debate about who wrote their account first, Mark or Paul. Both are dated to around 50 AD. But one thing is certain is that when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, he quoted the creed regarding the Lord's Supper, which he had taught them and which he had taken out on his various missionary journeys. And this reflects the early practice in the primitive church for observing the Lord's Supper prior to 50 AD. In the previous videos, we looked at how Jesus' practice of sharing meals with others established lines of relationship and patronage with them. How he challenged and upended many of the practices involved with meals during that day, and how his practice of eating with the lowest and most despised member of societies and the movers and shakers created a community of followers that was radically inclusive. In the early church, the Lord's Supper was a communal memory of Jesus' life and practices. It also reflected the concerns of his first followers, who were established in a new community within the Greco-Roman world. Originally, it was not just a sacrament concerning bread and wine like we observe today. Rather, the primary focus was that of shared food and drink, and the bread and the wine were only one part of a much larger meal. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible, and my name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching and writing and researching in graduate schools and seminaries for the past 30 or so years and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you like these videos and they take a lot of effort to produce, please consider subscribing, giving it a thumbs up. That way YouTube knows to recommend these videos to other people as well. Thanks. Now today we're diving into 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's teaching on the Lord's Supper. And this section can be broken down into three sections, the problem, the creed, and the solution. Now, I'm going to be reading from the New English Translation today. You can follow along in another Bible, but let's take a look at the problem first. Starting with 1 Corinthians 11:17. Now, in giving the following instruction, I do not praise you, because you do not come together for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must in fact be divisions among you, so that those of you who are approved may be evident. Now when you come together at the same place, you are not really eating the Lord's Supper. For when it is time to eat, everyone proceeds with his own supper. One is hungry, and another becomes drunk. Do you not have houses that you can eat and drink? Or are you trying to show contempt for the church of God by shaming those who have nothing? What should I say? Should I praise you? I will not praise you for this. Notice in verse 17 that Paul opens immediately with this, I do not praise you. 
Now, just as a side note, and I'm gonna throw this in, completely free, no one's gonna charge you for it. In verses one through 16 of this chapter, Paul has been discussing whether women should have their heads covered when they are praying and prophesying in the worship service. All too often today, we use that passage to pound women over the head as another example that they should not hold positions of leadership or teaching within the church. However, for Paul, what was happening there was not a problem. Whatever is happening there, he praises them for what they are doing. Notice in verse 3. They just need to resolve this one issue. They need to kind of like fine tune the radio here to get it just right. But when it comes to this section on the Lord's Supper, and we use it as a model for how we should celebrate communion, in this passage, Paul is using the creed of the Lord's Supper to pound them over the head. We read these two sections in 1 Corinthians 11 in just about the opposite way that Paul intended them. We read the praise as a rebuke or control, and then we read the rebuke as a model to follow. But I digress. Let's get back to the text. If table fellowship was the primary vehicle during that day for establishing community and lines of patronage, what the Corinthians were doing was just the opposite. They are creating divisions, schisms, and factions in the church, verses 18 and 19. So instead of observing a meal that was intended to bring the church together with Jesus as the patron and the one around whom all were gathered, they were dividing themselves up. In verse 20, he writes, Now when you come together at the same place, you are not really eating the Lord's Supper. The English Standard Version has, For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. The Greek word behind this idea is pralambano, to have something beforehand, to have something copiously, to take something before others. And in this context, it's being talked about eating, to eat before, to eat copiously, to eat ahead of other people. And the idea is that the food is not being shared properly. There are some who really seem to be eating quite well, maybe even pigging out. They might have brought their own food to share with others, but they really don't. It's difficult to translate this verse without explaining the cultural practices behind it. Now, in the previous videos, we looked at Pliny and Marshall's complaints about how some hosts would rank the food they gave out to their guests. The host and their best friends got the best food, those not so popular got lesser fare to eat and drink, and those at the lowest rung on society's ladder who were present at that meal got the real dregs. The way that honor and status were either shown or not shown during a Greco-Roman meal was something that was criticized by many, along with Jesus, and see my last video on that. This appears to be what is happening here as well. The Corinthians are dividing themselves up according to status and standing. The wealthy and better off members within the church were able to come to the house where the church was meeting earlier than others. It appears that they had a pretty good meal and they ate ahead of and before others. The rich could come earlier because they had more flexibility and freedom. They have a royal feast. Then when those who were on the lower end of the social economic ladder where slaves showed up, all the good food was gone. In fact, some of those who came earlier had such a good time, Paul says, that they were drunk. Some of the negative aspects of their cultural background was being carried over into the church with how they observed the Lord's Supper. As a result, Paul says that they are shaming those who have nothing, and by doing so, they are showing contempt for the church of God. For the patrons of the church to provide a meal would have been a very attractive feature within the early church. Most of the church at Corinth were city dwellers and experienced food insecurity on a regular basis. They were dependent on the patronage from wealthier citizens. Paul calls this meal the Lord's Supper. What's interesting is that this title would not be widely adopted until the time of the Reformation. Paul uses this term to emphasize that Jesus was the true and selfless host who gave himself for them. Therefore, they should reject the social disparities that were practiced in other meals like this. Let's turn to the creed in verses 23 through 26. Notice right at the very start as I read this, that Paul opens it by saying, what I received, I passed on. 
These are technical terms that he uses to let you know that he memorized this word for word, he received it, and then when he passed it on, he made sure that you knew it word for word also. He uses these same terms in 1 Corinthians 15 when he's talking about the creed concerning Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And I've got a video on that and I'll have the link up over here for you. Starting with verse 23. For I received from the Lord why I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When Paul writes that he received this from the Lord, this reflects a chain of command or tradition that goes all the way back to the Lord. Paul got it from other believers, but sees its authority as resting with Jesus. But there is also a tone of intimacy in this title. Jesus keeps this meal with those who keep this tradition or command. Paul appeals to them and recounts this tradition to correct what is going on at Corinth. In verse 24, he says, do this in remembrance. This is not just a memory exercise, but to think on it, vividly call it to mind, to realize what has happened. In verse 26, Paul's use of you proclaim is rather interesting. It turns the practice of eating the meal into a memorial act that is compared with saying something. It's a visible message. F.F. F. Bruce wrote, You proclaim is like the Passover meal. The Lord's Supper is an event intended to remind, teach, and participate in judgment. Thus, it is an act of proclamation. There are also three time frames in which we are to remember during this meal. Past. We are to remember Jesus' practice of eating with every and anyone and how this created his community and was a visible manifestation of the inclusive nature of the kingdom of God. Present, we partake of this table now and thus we should be realizing how these principles break into our lives and world. This is where the first Corinthians were getting into trouble. Future, until he comes. In the future, we have a meal in heaven laid up for us when Jesus inaugurates the new age with the marriage feast of the Lamb. So the Lord's Supper has sort of three temporal elements to it, past, present, and future, that we should call to mind and think of when we remember and observe this feast. There are also three selves in the observance of the Lord's Supper. When we celebrate this meal in remembrance, it involves, number one, self-involvement. We are actually eating this meal and expressing our gratitude and worship with God and with others. Self-identification. We are to bring to mind and reflect on Christ's crucifixion and what that means for our lives. There we are crucified in Christ. And then self-transformation. We are part of a new community. We have a new identity with Christ and those around us. We are not our own, but we have been bought with a price. Therefore, we should live in a way that reflects this reality. Finally, in verses 27 through 34, Paul is going to lay out practical solutions for the problems confronting the church in Corinth. Starting in verse 27. For this reason, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself first, and in this way let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body eats and drinks judgment against himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and quite a few are dead. But if we examined ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you assemble, it does not lead to judgment. I will give directions about other matters when I come. In verses 27 through 34, Paul discusses the solution to the problem there. In verse 28, he talks about self-examination. 
Now the tradition that I started my Christian life in was one in which was very pietistic and very individualistic, like most of the American church. And this self-examination was one of what am I doing within my life? But in this particular case here, this is not a general self-examination in nature, looking over all your life, but is directed at your attitude towards Christ's death and your incorporation and participation with others in the church. In verse 30, Paul talks about that because of how they are observing the Lord's Supper, they are not just despising other members of the church, but also despising and shaming the host, Jesus. Even though a theology of the meal elements, the bread and the wine as the Eucharist for Jesus' body and blood would not be worked out for some centuries, the earliest evidence suggests that Christian meals and their food were experienced as sacred that eating this meal together with one another was seen as a sacred activity and participating with Jesus. Because of how they were participating in this meal, showing divisions in social rank and status within the church, Paul claims that this is why some of them are sick and some have died. It is not that this meal has magical elements to it, but that the consequences of this are divine punishment. Remember, Jesus is the host who is providing this meal. And by eating and participating in this meal, we are now being incorporated into his kingdom and his community. Now, alongside this act of self-reflection, making sure that you're coming to this meal with the right attitude of being incorporated into God's kingdom, Paul offers two practical points of advice in verses 33 and 34. He instructs them, A, to wait for one another. As Pliny wrote in the last video, my freedmen do not eat the same food as I do, but rather I eat theirs. Pliny, a governor, is talking about how he then adapts his life to eat the same food as those who were once slaves and are now free. He eats the same food as they do. Paul wants those who have the privilege to arrive early to wait for those who do not have that luxury and are not able to arrive earlier and eat well. Second, if someone is really hungry and can't wait, Paul gives a very simple solution. Let them eat at home. In other words, grab a bite to eat before you show up. I love that advice because I'm pretty big, about 6'5 and 220 pounds, so I eat a lot. And when we go to someone else's house for a meal, I always make sure to eat something first before we leave our house. That way, I'm not too much of a pig at their house. This is what Paul is suggesting here. Before you leave your house, eat something first, so that when you observe the Lord's Supper, you can participate with the right attitude and perspective of others, rather than just looking out for your own needs and desires at that meal. I always find it interesting that the authors and compilers of the New Testament show us both the strengths and the glaring failures of the early church. Table fellowship and eating with others establish relationships, community, and lines of patronage in the Greco-Roman world. Jesus' teaching on and practices of eating with others was very egalitarian and radically inclusive. He ate with men and women, the rich and the poor, the clean and the unclean. However, the church at Corinth slid back into their cultural values in their practice of the Lord's Supper, and as a result, they got it so wrong. They brought their cultural values of class and honor distinctions into the Lord's Supper. Those who were better off were enjoying a great meal and time together. But when those who were poor showed up, all the good food was gone and some of those who had arrived earlier were drunk. The result was that they shamed their brothers and sisters in Christ and divided the church. Our observance of the Lord's Supper today is a visible and enacted proclamation of Jesus' life and sacrifice for us. By partaking in this meal, we physically enact and remember our being incorporated into this new community and kingdom that Jesus instituted. The patron of this meal is Jesus, who gave his life for all of us, no matter who we are. And as members of this community, we are to go and do likewise. 
And finally, when we do this in remembrance, it involves three time frames. We remember what Jesus did for us in the past. We remember what Jesus is doing now in our lives, incorporating us into his new kingdom. And we look forward to the day when the kingdom comes in the future. Let us go forward in the word of peace. Oh, I almost forgot to give you an update on our house. Because so many homes and businesses got hit hard with the windstorm last week, this work has been moving rather slowly. The tree is finally down off our house, but now it's on the lawn. Our dogs are not happy about this, but they've never been known for their patience. We're going to need part of our roof rebuilt so far, and they think that the back of the house is structurally sound, which is a great thing. The sad thing is, is that we're also going to need to have this tree removed as well. It's leaning and near the end of how long it lives. And if this came down in the middle of four houses, well, we may not be so lucky next time. Hopefully in a few weeks, I can show you our yard and house back up in a normal running order. Until then, peace. Thank you.